Welcome everybody. Uh, this is our biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense uh, Lab. Uh, today it's our honor to have Dr. Anka Blanchard from France speak on the vulnerabilities of the e-voting system used in the recent uh, French presidential election. This talk um, is the last uh, regularly scheduled talk of CDL for this spring term, and we will resume in the fall with bi-weekly meetings Fridays at noon. Um, we do have a special talk next week, uh, Wednesday at nine o'clock in this room. Um, one of my master's students, uh, Kerlios El Saad, will present his interesting work on formal methods analysis using CPSA of the uh, session binding um, protocol, and he's found some weaknesses with that protocol. Um, Dr. Uh, Blanchard is an expert in usability and security, and he and they are uh, a member of the French National Center for Scientific Research. It's our honor to have Dr. Blanchard speak to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, you hear me well, and you see the slides, right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so this is a very recent uh, joint work uh, with uh, multiple colleagues from different fields. Uh, Antoine Gallet, who's also in the LAMI uh, in the UPHF. Um, Emmanuel Leblon, uh, who's an independent uh, security specialist. Uh, Joar Sidoumhal, who's a legal scholar. And uh, Juliette Walter, who's a journalist and computer technician. So um, this is recent work because uh, all, all of this has been done over the last few months and the actual uh, paper was just accepted for publication. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it should be available on the uh, HAL. I will be talking about uh, a system that uh, was used recently and I will be talking about verifiable voting. Um, and as some of you familiar with the field might know, there's a always an issue when you come to voting, which is how do you guarantee um, the how do you guarantee the anonymity of the ballot that no one can track uh, who voted what and the verifiability so that everyone can be sure that the ballot box indeed and that the results, the tally corresponds to the desires of the people who voted. Now, uh, for a long time, but historically where this was deemed impossible over the last few decades, we've seen uh, systems that actually allow uh, us to get both those properties of verifiability and anonymity at the same time. But the system I will present today uh, might have the distinction of guaranteeing neither. So allowing you to potentially prove how you voted without being sure that this is actually how you voted. Uh, so I'll give you a, a little bit of, of background. So the French presidential election uh, happened, uh, you know, last month um, with uh, nearly 49 million voters. The principle was uh, pretty simple. It's uh, a two round paper based election. It's not entirely paper based. There are experimental districts, uh, but they are a very like less than one per 1000 of voters use electronic machines. All the others use a very simple ballot. You have a ballot, you have one name, you choose which ballot you have, you fold it, you put it in an envelope, and you put it in a ballot box. Uh, this doesn't allow uh, absentee voting like normal American style, but it does allow proxy voting. So you ask someone to vote in your stead, you go to the police station and you make a, a legal form to do that. So each ballot is very simple. The system is actually very secure in that it's very hard to create a large scale attack due to lots of uh, safeguards, lots of multiple checks. Uh, and so it costs a lot of money, like 250 million uh, for an election of this kind. Part of it, about one quarter is uh, for campaign costs, but the rest is uh, in, big, in big part logistics. So uh, there is a pressure to, to lower these costs and uh, e-voting has uh, been advocated as one potential way to do this. So um, the, the, there are rules for e-voting that have been created and updated over time. So there are very long rules. Um, but uh, I'll just look at some of the main ones that 
I'm interested in today, uh, which were made by the CNIL, the uh, French Commission on uh, Computers, like Informatics and Freedom. Um, and those rules are the following. To ensure the total separation of the voter's identity and the expression of their vote for the whole processing duration. So that's basically guaranteeing the anonymity of the ballot. Ensure that the opening of the ballot box and the tallying of its content can be verified a posteriori. This is one form of verifiability, a sort of weak form. Um, and those, by the way, are, are classed. So elections of level one don't have a lot of importance. For example, uh, boardroom elections within a university would fall under the guidelines one. But every level, every additional level means more stringent security. So, for example, at level two, you need to use an information system that uh, guarantees uh, that it uses the security measures recommended for the ANSI, which is the French National uh, Informatics Security uh, Agency. And then you also need to ensure the transparency of the ballot box for all voters. And at level three, not only do you need to ensure the transparency of the ballot box for all voters, but you need to allow voters to check the transparency using third party tools. So those might be a bit weird as, as guidelines, but they are actually based on a very physical system. So I, I think they might be reframed. They might need to be reframed because uh, the transparency of the ballot box is because our ballot boxes are literally transparent. So no one can add anything into them uh, without anyone noticing. So th there is an issue of interpretation of those guidelines in electronic uh, frameworks. but. To, to finish, uh, as starting from level two, you need to guarantee uh, safety measures recommended by ANSI. And ANSI recommends some pretty standard measures, uh, one of which is that unless you have high technical expertise and high cryptographic expertise, uh, you shouldn't use new protocols. You should only use uh, cryptographic tools that are validated by experts that are tested and maintained and use external libraries. You should not develop code in-house and you should definitely not develop algorithms in-house unless you have very high expertise. So this makes that sense for us. So the NeoVote company, which is uh, the, the system that we analyzed, was founded about 15 years ago and had very little online presence or presence at all until five years ago. It is now presumably the biggest actor on the French voting market, uh, handling, according to them, 10,000 votes per year. Uh, and we have found in French uh, legal documents that more than 245 companies and public institutions use them, for example, for union voting or for uh, local elections, um, using uh, publicly available uh, French data. Uh, we looked at competitive markets. Um, and we saw that over the last few years, they managed to get uh, at least 21 of those large markets up to 1.3 million euros each. Uh, and including one of them, which was pretty surprising because uh, it was by the Institute that is host to, uh, in, in a way, to the people who developed um, the Belenios voting system, which is one of the best in the world today. Uh, and so instead of using the system they developed in-house, they chose to use NeoVote. And where it gets interesting for us, it's is that they were chosen to uh, organize the votes for three of the main primaries for the French presidential election. So we have lots of parties um, and uh, each one is actually free. There are not that many regulations on how they are supposed to choose their primary candidates. Um, it's, it's not that codified. And so they were free to use uh, different systems, including NeoVote. Uh, now, EELV uh, is uh, the ecological party, uh, used it in September. Uh, Les Républicains, which is a traditional right-wing uh, party, uh, used it in December. And, and it was one of the two major parties in France until this election, basically. And there was a, a new party which had a lot of popular uh, following initially, uh, which used it in late January. So our work actually focuses generally on this last one, because it is for this last one that we uh, 
we looked at the election in details and uh, participated. So there is a, a little bit of previous work on neo votes. Uh, the thing is, most of it was in the media, in in the news channels, uh, like in written news, because there were issues uh, mostly with the primaire populaire, this last election, which was very uh, like that had a big mediatic impact because some people uh, managed to register multiple times. Actually, one of them is listening to this talk. Um, and there were also lots of questions on the tallying method, which is the uh, majority judgment, which is a very interesting tallying method. Uh, and it has advantages. But the problem is that those are mostly attacks that do not concern new vote directly. Uh, or, or that concern every voting system, it's how do you register for it is an issue. Um, there was one public analysis of new votes uh, made by uh, academics, um, by De Barros, Gergoud, Grelar, and Thibault. Uh, so uh, if I remember correctly, it's uh, three students in master's and their uh, supervisor, who's a professor and researcher at, at University of Bordeaux who had the opportunity to look at it more carefully because there was an internal election within the university, which is not extremely high stakes. And so they, they saw quite a lot of vulnerabilities, um, including with the uh, way they transmitted the ballots, uh, the, with the registration procedure and uh, with privacy issues. So uh, we were in touch with uh, Véronique Cortier who's uh, one of the leading experts in France on voting security. Uh, and we talked to her about uh, the, 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 this issue and that we were looking into it. And she actually put us in touch with a whistleblower uh, who had contacted her for uh, analysis of data from the previous election in uh, EELV, like the ecologists. And, uh, and that's more or less how this project started um, because this whistleblower actually joined our team. And we, part of our work was, was uh, from what they did initially. So we did have multiple questions, uh, including ethical questions, which is that we were not uh, facing the Bordeaux election, which in the worst case can be repeated. We were facing a critical election uh, that was very highly disputed um that cost a lot of money and that uh, that we could not afford to delegitimize uh if we did anything wrong and so we were wondering how do we analyze the system without interfering with with, with it now we were lucky in that the primaire populaire was a very popular movement that then just kind of disappeared so our criticism of it uh is strong but it do it doesn't affect the end result of the election at all like none of what we're saying here uh means that the elections uh ha the french presidential elections happened uh with irregularities that could have changed in any way the results so our decisions for for this uh primaire populaire vote was to register as usual voters without trying to influence the pro the process except by just voting normally and to record everything that we did, download the code, analyze it, uh, screen record everything, and to compare the code with the previous elections. Because you know we had one member who had given us previous code, but we needed to authenticate it. Uh, and as it happens, uh, this, this person had also warned NeoVote and the CNIL and ANSI French you know, institutions to guarantee the security. Uh, had warned them more than three months earlier, so we were free to actually make all this public. We, we, we did the correct thing. I mean, Emmanuel did the correct thing. So then, what does Neo Vote claim to do? Because, you know, I've, I've been saying, and they, they, they actually sell their system pretty well. They say they've had 10,000 votes with no technical issues. That's good. And they say that they've been homologated by top institutions, the French Senate, the National Assembly, multiple ministries. Now, the first issue when you get there is that normally those top institutions do not homologate anything. They, they do not give any form of homologation. So the first question is, you say you've done this, but what does it mean? And when pressured, apparently they don't say anything. Like this is uh, from, uh, from uh, my colleague's work. 
Now, the next part is uh, their security and technical guarantees. They say that they do not use any external code. Uh, they have a modified Debian and they have a full cryptographic stack. Um, this goes against ANSI regulations unless they are indeed at the very high cryptographic level that they claim to have, which, you know, might be the case. But you continue and then you start seeing more and more weird things. So they say that they are deployed on Secnum Cloud, which is the French highest level of, uh, of regulation for like cloud, secure, secure cloud systems. They also say about in the same sentence that they use no cloud services. So we actually don't know what their position on cloud is. And they use a lot of non-standard vocabulary in e-voting systems. They say they avoid uh, mélanger, which would, I think the only translation I can imagine of is mixnets. So they say that their security is because they avoid using mixnets. That is my interpretation. It's, it's just mine. It's just, I don't, I can't think of anything else that makes sense. They use random ballot boxes and geometric models without explaining uh, what this means. And they are not transparent at all. No one has, I mean, no one outside the institution knows uh, what kind of protocol they use, what kind of algorithms they use, including for, for tallying, for internal uh, handling. We don't know. And their justification is that they handle top secret information so that they cannot make anything public. So this is really security through obscurity. So, you know, you see these claims, that's what we did. And that if, if you're an academic and you vote work on, on e-voting, you think, okay, I need to dig, I need to understand what's behind this. And so one way of doing this is, is to look at the code. Um, now there are two issues. The first is that we did not have access to their code, except the things that were publicly facing. So, you know, you, when you vote, you get to the server, it, it shows you your vote, but it shows you things. Um, but all this code was obfuscated. Uh, we, we, we checked it, uh, regenerating the page changes all variable and function names. There is a naming scheme, which uh, we could not uh, figure, like we, we, we figured some things, but it seems to be linked to scope, but it is not easy. And, and by the way, there are, thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of obfuscated code. Uh, so um, th thankfully, uh, someone uh, with us was good at, at, at looking at looking through this and finding patterns, finding uh, structure, which is maintained, and strings, because of course, you can't obfuscate the stuff you need to print on the screen. And sometimes the scope of certain external functions prevented obfuscation. So a lot of our work was done by comparing the structures and the strings. Uh, there's one additional small issue, uh, which is that um, it was hard to download the scripts because uh, we don't know why, but we had repeated bugs when we were trying to download the packet exchanges. Uh, we reproduced it multiple times. I don't know what happened. It might not be on them. It, it's just that we had regular issues, and when we tried to archive what we could see um, in non-authenticated pages through, for example, uh, archive.org, it resists any attempts. So there was the question of, you know, if we saw something that was bad, could we document it externally with a sort of neutral uh, copy? Um, so you know you 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 can see that uh, we looked at the code and uh, one one thing we were wondering about was this uh, code uh, was whether they what what kind of code they used what did, what did it indicate but actually what we found is that they did not follow their own claims uh, according to which they just um, made all their code in in house. Now, this is good, by the way. If it is the ANSI regulations, you do not want to recode AES. You, you want to use a, a verified, taste, tested, maintained library uh, of AES. And um, that's, that's fine. So the thing is, um, this is Emmanuel's work. We did find it. We, we did find where they used it. 
and where they did not remake it in-house, they copied it. Um, now, there are a, a few questions because they actually transpiled it. Um, it's it's uh, not the exact same scripting language, but it's actually the, the, the same code. Um, so this, you know, this is just, you could say this is a coincidence, but when you get about 50 lines in a row where everything is the same, including the constants, you, you, you think, okay, there is, there is solid evidence that this code is copied. So you can see that the, um, the variable names and the function names are, are modified. Uh, but I tried to, to, to color some of them so that we can see that they, they repeat. Uh, this is just an excerpt the, the, the paper has like way longer uh, example. So what does this mean? It means that they actually used uh, an external library. That's fine. Now, there's a bigger problem, which is that what is this external library? It's actually on GitHub. It's uh, asm.crypto. Uh, no, asmcrypto.js. It's, it's a JavaScript library that's just made to create faster uh, cryptographic uh, results uh, at the expense sometimes of security. It, it is uh, in the details of this library, they say we we focused on speed. So this is not very good. <laughs> like you, you, And also it's not a standard library. It's not that many people use it. Um, and it hasn't been updated. Like I don't think there has been any major update in four years. Like there was one test file added a few, three years ago, I think. But it's 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 an old library that is not really maintained and that has too few users to be truly tested, apparently. But well, maybe everything in it is correct. And that is um, when we actually get to the second interesting fun part, which is that there is another function we found in it. Uh, now, in the uh, in the recent version of, of of new votes code, you only see uh, some some of it, um, but basically they reuse a function that you can see in ASM crypto, and it's actually not a function that belongs to ASM crypto. It's a function that belongs to uh, a pull request that was made uh, a few years ago by someone saying, "Hey, you should add this function to the library," uh, and this function adds support, and the 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 only thing it does is add support for a certain version of RSAES PK, PKCS, which is considered obsolescent by now. Um, so the only reason to have this is if you use this function, which by now everyone is saying you probably shouldn't use. And so this indicates multiple things. First, that of course they use external code, but that they used external code from a library that is not maintained, nor standard, and they don't actually use it from this library, but from pull requests, which really seems to indicate that they manually copied the code, just copy paste, uh, at some point in the last five years, uh, and probably didn't update it since, uh, because it's it's still there with and it's still being used, um, and it was already uh, in in some ways obsolescent at the time. So. This is not reassuring in terms of their security and cryptographic expertise if they use obsolete tools or obsolescent tools that uh, have been known to be this way for a while. OK, so this is just for the really technical part. Um, now, what happens to the tally? Um, I think that uh, a lot of people here uh, might be familiar with end-to-end uh, -end, uh, voting. Um, and NeoVote does not use end-to-end -end element, not really. So this is the protocol that I actually received uh, last night uh, through exchanges with the uh, voting officer for the Primaire Populaire. So the raw results were computed by NeoVotes, uh, were, were seen by NeoVotes and sent to three parties, the election administration, the CNIL expert, and an independent legal officer. There was independent confirmation everywhere that all went, all went well. And uh, then they computed the true tally with this uh, majority judgment method and made it public. But 
the raw results were never made public, uh, well, according to him, and they shouldn't. And uh, the reasoning was that because you want to check that everything went well, you should not have it be public at any time, which hurts my sensibilities at least. Um, and, and so from NeoVote, there was no end-to-end -end method there. At some point, they sent, I don't know if it was by email or through which method, they send the results manually, which were then input on the website manually. Now, this is not on NeoVote's fault. The, this, this does not belong in NeoVote analysis, but it's a consequence of what happens when you do this, when you don't have an integrated system that does the tallying, the vote computing and everything, which is that this is the uh, 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 screen capture from the uh, vote from the results page on the results day, about two hours after uh, they were published. Um, and what you see is uh, the, the ranking of each candidate. So because of majority judgments, everyone had to evaluate each candidate by giving, it, giving them a grade from one to five, from like best to not, well, very good to uh, very bad. And uh, so you can see that there is a, a, a repartition. And the fun thing is that normally you should have the same number of votes of evaluations on all candidates. Um, now you can see that for the second candidate, you have 392,738 uh, um, evaluations posted. Uh, if you see my mouse, uh, Alan, can you see my mouse? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is where it is. You see the number of votes, you see the tally, everything's fine. Then you look at the first candidate and you see that there was only 100 votes. That is weird. Uh, and then you see the third candidate and you see there were only five. So actually what happened is if you look at the data behind the page, uh, the third one was manually put as one vote in each category. The first one as uh, just the approximate percentages in each category and the central one worked fine. So they had a database issue, I guess, but we actually did not see a, a public notice on, on the website after that they fixed this and that there was a mistake. It just changed the results without seeing that uh, this, this thing was, without saying, hey, we made a mistake earlier, we had wrong results online. Uh, now, for Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who was really, like his results are false, his actual results were worse than that. So he, he can't really complain that the election was, was unfair in this thing. And this is on the Primaire Populaire front. It, it's, it's only linked to new votes in that they gave uh, uh, they, they gave raw results without allowing users uh, a, a sort of uh, paper trail that would just guarantee the integrity at all steps. And now we go to the verification because NeoVote claims to be in some ways verifiable as is mandated by the CNIL regulations. Now, uh, they say you can check your vote later and check that it was counted correctly uh, when, when you vote um, and you end up with a long string in your browser, which is a proof of vote. Now, two things. First, they say it's forbidden to share your proof of vote. Now, you, you might wonder, um, you know, the, the uh, oh, um, yes. Uh, so it, it, you might wonder, uh, why it, it is forbidden to share a proof of vote or to share your receipt. Um, in, in some systems, uh, there is indeed a danger in sharing it in that it can reduce, for example, in reverse three ballots and the systems that like, are made from that, it can reduce the problem, it can increase the probability of having an attack that is workable. But assuming that uh, you do it after um, well, uh, assuming that you, you, you make your proof of vote public after the tally is public and everything, uh, there should be, ideally, no way to track uh, how you voted from this proof of vote. I mean, cryptographically, it should be uh, guaranteed anonymity. Uh, so you, you have to wonder why it is forbidden. And 
one thing is it's also easy to skip the proof about. I'll show you how. This is a usability question. So for the um, uh, ecologist votes for that election, the proof of vote verification mechanism apparently worked, uh, and they had some public-facing data. And so this is where uh, our, our uh, analysis comes from in some ways. For the primaire populaire, we did not manage to verify, and a lot of other people didn't. Um, and uh, according to Samuel Thibault uh, from Bordeaux University, in the university it worked, and for a vote that just happened a couple of days ago, it's not working. So there is a question of, you know, what happened with the verification procedure? And for the Primaire Populaire, we were not told. We were told, you know, check, use this code so that you can verify, keep it. I'll, I'll show you. Um, I don't know if you can see it uh, accurately, uh, but this is what the web page looked like. Um, on, 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 during the Primaire Populaire vote, I, I removed identifying information except the vote code. Um, and this is the interesting thing. So you see at the bottom here, you have download in PDF, receive by email, or disconnect, log out. Um, now, if you do, and you, you see your vote proof, if you do any of those, you actually get logged out and you receive a receipt without the vote proof. The actual way to get it is to click on this button here, which is not well indicated. Um, so what actually happened is that uh, in our team of five, two of us uh, clicked the wrong button. And one of us did that after being warned that there was a wrong button and that we should be careful. Uh, so if, if you download in PDF, it, it gives you a download which doesn't say anything. Uh, it, it just gives you a receipt which says you voted, but without any information. So you know this is, this is silly, but it, it is a problem that uh, you, you make it in a way the user's fault if they did not manage to download their vote code, which reduces the number of people who can check, even among the ones who want. And by the way, once you've done this, if you click on any of the buttons and you leave the page or you do anything, you cannot access this page anymore. It, it's locked out. So you only see it shown once. Now, we, we got this screen capture because we were recording everything we did, but that was the only way for us to keep the code. So we, we did, did not have publicly available codes because uh, we were not invited. We, we did not receive any instructions on how to analyze it, uh, how, how to check that our, our vote was counted, either by email or on the NeoVote site. We went to its server uh, which to this verification server tried a lot of combinations of our different logins and and um, and vote codes and stuff. We did not get anything. We could not make it work. So uh, all all the analysis there are based on Emmanuel's uh, work earlier, uh, and well, they're mostly my analysis on on what we glanced at the structure of the vote code from this previous election. And uh, what we did was basically try to authenticate the, the code to check that it is indeed the real new vote code and compare it with Samuel Thibault's analysis to check that it does the same thing. So uh, the verification structure uh, is that apparently each receipt that you receive it is composed of five hashes, which are computed on the client side and uh, in a way um, Yes, uh, as, as, as Thibault said, uh, that the verification code used to be available, like how they do it and everything. And now they, they uh, made it, they hid it. Uh, and they hid it actually a little while after um, Emmanuel messaged them to say, hey, there might be issues with it. Uh, so Emmanuel messaged them in, um, in, in, um, in October and since at, at some point since the all, all the code has disappeared from their website, so we don't know how they verify anymore. So, uh, so each receipt is uh, composed of five hashes, and those uh, are then, in a way, um, encrypted using a constant public key. So we don't even know why. And uh, if you download it at the time when it was possible to download their system from their website, 
the ballot box basically uh, has a few files, but one of them is a ballot box file with a list of one ballot encrypted and one hash, and a different file called extra hashes, which are meant to not be counted. Um, the verification protocol works like this. The system that this is NeoVote's initial code. It removes the hashes present in the extra hash file from the ballot box file. It checks that the remaining uh, hashes present in your receipt are in the ballot box. Then it asks the server to decrypt all ballots, which are uh, encrypted using the service public key. And then it tallies the vote. So, um, you know, why not? Uh, why five hashes? Well, uh, let's let's first have fun with the ballot box. First, it's it well at least it was not digitally signed. So the first thing you can do if you want is you download the real ballot box, and uh, you modify it by moving some hashes from the ballot box file to the extra hash file so that they become ignored. Um, and uh, you do not need to digitally sign it because they did not digitally sign it. So uh, then if you manage to public, publish a, a different vote verification website by cyber squatting in, in any way, you can make the election, you, you can get people to check and get the tally to be what you want. Now, of course, you're not new vote, but if you manage to impersonate them, it's fine. But the, the more way more problematic thing is that the receipt has one release because the receipts are also not uh, digitally signed. So that means that if I download the ballot box data from your vote, I can create a receipt that is indistinguishable from a real receipt from everything we know, by the way. And we can create fake receipts attack. They say, hey, look, I tried to check and my vote is not in it. And NeoVote has no public method to uh, say, this is a real receipt, this is a fake receipt. We, we don't know. So what they can do is they could potentially, if anyone came and said, look, you, you, my, my vote was not counted, they could just say, uh, well, uh, that's because you are actually an attacker and you are creating fake receipts to uh, delegitimize the election. So this is a, a big issue in, in, in lots of voting systems, which is how do you uh, prevent people from delegitimizing by, by saying that, uh, their, um, that their ballot was not counted. Well, the system that we developed actually with uh, Alan Sherman and uh, Ted Selker um, and, uh, and uh, Ryan um, is is that uh, it has this vulnerability in a way, but it's a different scale. It's for boardroom meetings, so it doesn't like so. So the social pressures are different, and attacking the election to delegitimize it is a weaker pressure. For national elections, there is a pressure. So okay, we can probably uh, we we can fake the results uh, if we manage to impersonate the votes. We can make as many fake ballots as we want to denounce the election, but we're not yet at the worst part. Um, so it's, it's hard to be sure because uh, part of what is left on, on this is speculation from the code they, that was temporarily available. But if you look at the hash structure of, of how new vote handles it, its hashes, um, you can do a sort of uh, like just list cases. If, uh, if Basically, uh, you look at your five hashes in your receipt, and none of them is in the ballot box. So there's your real hash for your real ballot, and four extra hashes that are all in the extra hash. Then, by just registering your hashes initially and sending them to an accomplice, uh, once everything becomes decipherable, they can see that your only remaining hash is for this candidate so they can prove how you voted by just sending your receipt before everything is public. If only some hashes are present of, of, of the things you received in the ballot box, you can probably prove how you didn't vote. Say, look, I have a hash for this candidate and that candidate, 
and also this third candidate, but not for any of the others. So you can prove that you didn't vote for any of the others. Uh, this, by the way, um, just a, a, a small mention, it, it is a, a worse attack that, than you can imagine. So imagine if you have two major candidates uh, and, and a minor one, uh, coerce, or, and a few minor ones, coercion can actually be just vote for this minor one so that I know that you did not uh, vote for my opponent. And if you can prove that you did not vote for any of the big ones, it's, it's, it's fine. Um, so for the, for, for the, the new vote hashes, uh, we have to assume that all the hashes you receive in your receipt are generally in the ballot box, are the hashes of other people, so that you mix everyone's receipt, which is a, generally a pretty OK idea. You mix everyone's receipts so that you don't know who you voted for. But then you get two different issues. As long as all receipts are kept private, which is what NeoVote is trying to enforce, uh, organizers can very easily reuse hashes. So for example, say uh, every second vote for this one will actually use a hash that was already used. And uh, we, we actually got some bounds, but uh, if voters share on average uh, their, their receipt with one or two other voters, this attack works. And you can divide the votes for a candidate by a factor of two without anyone noticing, or, or at worst, you know, one person saying, hey, I, my receipt doesn't work. And then you say, hey, there's only one person saying that. Of course, it's an attack. They're trying to discredit us. So I'm not saying new vote did this at all, by the way. I'm just saying, you know, they could have, like nothing prevents it from in the system. But this is only as long as the voters don't share receipts following new votes guidelines. If the receipts are made public, are, are, a lot of them are made public though, uh, and really public, not just shared to two or three friends, then uh, we, can't, uh, we can do two things. Depending on how they are computed initially, which we don't know. We found multiple ways of naturally computing them. One of them is you take random hashes from different people. One of them is you guarantee that you take one hash from each uh, each other candidates, it, it's, uh, it, it varies, but in all cases, we end up with one problem, um, which is that uh, either you can prove how you vote or did not vote, or if they are made public and you can't prove that, then you can make sequence of voters and find voters whose hashes are close. And so you know that some of them did not vote for a given candidate because they have five times the same hash for candidate A. Uh, and, and they have uh, uh, different hashes for the others. So you, you can do this and through different analysis, you can de-anonymize at least partially some of the voters and sometimes a lot of the voters, depending on which proportion of the receipts are made public. So I'll, I'll just um, try to, 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 to summarize quickly um, this. No, I'll, I'll first, I'll just say about how it was handled legally. So there are a few legal cases about new vote in France. Uh, the appellate court canceled the vote by new votes in 2019 because its uh, privacy guarantees were not sufficient for a union vote. But there is actually an important decision made by the French Supreme Court, uh, so Cour de Cassation. Uh, and they, they made like, uh, it was a long decision, but two elements in it are according to, to our team, particularly dangerous. One of them is that the expertise in abstracto is enough. So that they said, you know, the system, the voting system should be checked. You should have an audit. But they said, as long as the system has not had a major change, an audit is not actually necessary. And the problem is that, especially with systems that rely on code, uh, you don't know if there has been a major change unless you have an audit. And by the way, all, all the information, uh, all, all the data, all these are, are kept very little time. The, the, uh, the, the, the period during which you could potentially verify was low. They, they try to get rid of the data as soon as possible. So if you don't audit immediately, you, you can't. And the Supreme Court considers that, no, it, it's fine if, if uh, there's no, if, if you just trust the purveyors of the system that it, it, it hasn't changed much, 
since the last audit. So that is a very weird decision. But the other problem is that they said that a two party, two factor authentication system was enough, uh, even in union votes. Uh, when the two factors were actually very weak because it asked you for, uh, I think, one email, a company email, and uh, your, I think it was the place where you were born. But both of those are accessible by HR in your company. Uh, and uh, someone actually did that, and someone, not in HR, but a colleague of, of the one complainant, uh, did say, look, I managed to vote in their stead because I managed to log in in their stead and they said yes but only because he shared his date of birth and place of birth with you so otherwise you would not have been able to do it but those are today quite easily available so there is a real issue of how do courts uh, take care of this uh, so to to conclude um, to to conclude that we, we see lots of you know, new e-voting systems, some based on blockchain, some not based on other things. And the legal frameworks uh, do not always appear solid enough to impose good security because, uh, as I said, like the, this court's decision was, you don't need to audit an e-voting system each time. It's fine. Um, and also, uh, by the way, all, all the audits we could find but one came from one same auditor who just writes the same thing each time. Yes, it's fine. Yes, it's fine signs it and it's fine. So, you know, if the auditor works all the time with the same company, uh, you can also get some perverse incentives uh, or just it makes it easier to make a mistake. And uh, finally, th there's technical expertise uh, we, we have in, in this online room. And this led to create mandated regulations. But as uh, I've tried to show, and as is detailed in the article, um, we don't even think that those regulations were applied. The, the ANSI uh, regulations were not applied. The CNIL regulations are not applied. And uh, one of my co-authors warned both institutions. Uh, now, that was more than six months ago. Um, and the company still says, look, we are homologated by everyone. So even, even when you have regulations in place, uh, I, I don't know how to make sure that those are applied because it seems that they are not. Now, the CNIL has a lot to do, especially right now, but you, 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 you have to wonder what prevents someone from just saying, hey, look, we've been uh, homologated and validated by all those people who never did. Maybe they did. We, we don't know. Uh, when we, when, when uh, I think uh, Samuel Thibault asked them to uh, show what they meant by being homologated, uh, I, I think they, they did not say anything. Um, so, so there is this issue of even when there are rules, how do you make sure that they are respected? And, and because it seems that today we do not have the institutional power to do so. So thank you for uh, your uh, attention. I, I took longer than I was uh, hoping to. Uh, I, uh, I'm willing to field any questions, of course. But I, I would appreciate if, if Samuel Thibault could say, uh, did, so you did check for the homologation with the Senai and stuff like that. You asked them, right? There are several people asked for it, and they never gave any answer. So several okay. people from different universities in France. Thank you. I'll uh, stop sharing the screen, I guess. What are Hi. your plans for future work? Uh, for future work on, on NeoVote? Uh, well, th there is, you know, there is one central issue, which is that uh, we, we did nearly all we could from what was available in, um, in, 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 in terms of data and code. Uh, and, and the lack, so here's the thing. Um, some of what we do is in a way um, not preliminary, but it, it is, uh, we made some assumptions. Now, generally what we do is we say, we assume that there are only two, two possibilities. 
either their hashes are included or they are not. And then we show that in both cases, uh, this, this creates problem. But uh, it means a lot of work because you do not know what's behind. And I think actually that the lack of transparency is by itself a huge issue. But that, that, I mean, I wrote something about this that was published, uh, I think, two, three months ago about that we do not mandate transparency in, uh, in e-voting. We, we don't mandate even transparency of the algorithm, not even the code. We don't even know what is supposed to be there. Uh, so in terms of future work, uh, unless we get more data from them or from whistleblowers, um, it is pretty limited. However, there is planned work on the legal front uh, of, of actually looking at how institutions can fight these things. And uh, also, how come uh, voting systems like this one get selected when uh, the ones that are established, peer reviewed, and 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 known to be relative quite quite secure, like you know, best practices, uh, never get nearly never get selected. Uh, it, it is a weird thing where even the Inria, which developed Belenios, didn't select the Belenios. which is like in all metrics better and it's free. Uh, so Ted, you had a question? Yeah, I have a couple of things. I guess transparency is a you know, big deal and it's been a problem for all elections, physical, ballotless, balloted, electronic forever. Um, you know, and in this country, in the US, US anyway, we have these things called the Vestals, they're the, there are these, you know, certification companies. They're they're completely untransparent, also. Um, and uh, you know, I know that it's also part of this future work question. Is, you know, um, by the way, I actually disagree. I've seen every kind of voting machine be selected for variety of reasons by people that have variety of ability to evaluate what they're going to be using, including sometimes making it themselves, thinking that they. Can make a better voting machine than anybody, you know. And they're, they're, they they happen to be election administrator, and they learned how to program last week. But um, uh, yeah, I just want to, you know, do you kind of have a dream, you know, where um, what would be an unassailable transparency um, world that that you could kind of like just feel great about? I mean, you get you did talk about that a bit, but I I, I just think it's really important. Uh, I, I mean, uh, a, a solution or a world where with different solutions existing. Well, uh, hey, you're the you're the answer. Um, and <laughs> no, I so, think that... <laughs> okay, I, I'm I'm going to to say something which is going to make Veronique Torti upset, but she's not here. Um, which is that uh, I don't think Belenios is is uh, is a very it is a great system in terms of usability. I don't think it's quite to the level of, of the others. However, it is fully transparent on so many fronts in terms of code. It's open source. It's the analysis of public and everything. So I'm thinking, you know, there's one issue is just, you know, making privacy guaranteeing and security guaranteeing systems a bit more user friendly and excluding, by the way, not user friendly for the end users, because for Belenios, it is relatively easy to vote uh, if you are uh, if you're a user but you know the, the 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 company that wants to use it internally or the institution needs to have someone to set up the server and everything right we we, we actually talked about this uh, with with Alan that it, sometimes you have rules inside the institution and it's not you know it's not off the shelf neovote says you know we take care of everything that's why you pay them a million and a million euros or something, um, and and that's also the thing. It's that they uh, they they provide a service, and how do we make sure that publicly available tools uh, that are often enough better? Uh, how do we create an ecosystem where those are used? Uh, there's actually the, the, those, this is discussions that are right, happening right now with. Uh, with uh, Veronique Cartier, but uh, but that's that's an that's an issue. 
Um, and also, by the way, one, one fun thing about Neohot is that I had access to some of their contracts um, through whistleblowers. And it looks like, um, it really looks like the, the, what they offer companies and what they offer things like, you know, big institution is pretty similar, but for companies, they charge about two or 3000 euros. And for public institutions, they charge up to 1 million and a half. Oh my God. For apparently nearly the same service. Um, so it's, it's fun. And just because Samuel Thibault did say something about what it would mean for, for transparency. And I think that is basically uh what ted and i have been arguing about no i'm arguing in favor of for the last i don't know how many years uh, which is that yes to get transparency it means that uh the the uh the 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 voters have to be able to understand the voting system and the verification system like this by the way uh samuel is the is is a lot of our work with ted uh, and also alan uh on how to make voting systems and verification systems like understandable very easily uh which by the way kind of means doing it without cryptography which is fun yeah can uh, i one one tiny follow-up question sure which is, you just said something that really struck me which is you know people go with these trusted or uh companies and uh, you know, setting up an election and running it carefully, um, I've watched where people can bollocks that, and that's the typical problem is, you know, people doing things on spreadsheets when they can make mistakes on spreadsheets. Um, and so a big part of the deal of the people pick these big companies is they're terrified uh, that, that there won't be protocol and process involved with some fly-by-night thing. Is that maybe where it comes from? It's 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 actually one of the biggest scandals in, of the past five months in France, which is that the government, instead of making of trusting its internal expertise in some things, uh, called in uh, external consulting companies to make the decisions for them. Like it, this, it's way more complex than that. But that is what they are being accused of, which is uh, externalizing the decision process to, in some ways, remove accountability. Say, no, look, we trusted the experts. And by the way, how are they experts? We don't know. Um, so are, are, are there questions uh, from other people? Yeah, Anka, I have a question. Please. Um, so one, one thing that tends to come up with, with voting, but also with other security topics is this idea of like the legal battle for these things. Do you know if anybody is doing any kind of adversarial modeling in the legal space? Uh, adversarial in terms of uh, like looking at adversarial like systems within legal, like who attacks whom and stuff like this? Yeah, because it seems like it's possible, you know, I don't want to make any claims, but it's possible in some cases, you know, the legal system is being weaponized by adversaries, you know, like Oh, so, um, okay. Um, so there is an issue, which is that uh, one of my, so my co-author who gave us some of the initial code um, was like received some very upset emails when he initially tried to publish this, uh, which uh, like he had just partial data and analysis. He didn't see, show, for example, that we could de-anonymize the stuff. Um, but he, yeah, he received some emails basically forbidding him from uh, printing anything, including the you know screen capture from the public facing websites of the company, saying anything you say that we could have written anywhere or anything is uh, under intellectual protection. And also all our email exchanges are under intellectual protection and, and everything. So you can't publish anything about us. Uh, and, and so, and, and the thing is uh, he's in a private company. Uh, there is, you know, if you risk being sued, this company apparently hires a lot of lawyers. Like if, they, if you go to their website, half of this, half of the, the, the claims are legal claims. Half of the, what they say is, look, we have a lot of legal expertise. We have a lot of lawyers in the house and everything. So you're thinking, okay, if I say anything, they're going to sue me. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't know what they're going to do with our work right now. Um, 
And uh, thank goodness I, I have the CNRS, like I got the CNRS approval for all this work, which we didn't initially have. Because that's the thing, you know, you think, you know, if I publish anything like that, on that, am I risking my career? Because these people have a lot of power, a lot of pool. If they managed, if, if um, so, uh, so Samuel Thibault, it's a study, so free from any question of defamation. Yes, but, um, you know, it's uh, slap lawsuits in the US. It's if I threaten to bother you a lot, and I have a lot of institutional pool because I organize votes for three major political parties. Uh, you know, you, you, it makes you think, it makes you wonder about whether you should, you know, be uh, careful about what you do. We actually had to revise our articles quite a lot to prevent anything in there from being too aggressive and to give them any handhold for a lawsuit. Uh, that, that's also not the main reason, but that's also why we have a legal scholar in our team. And we, we need her. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. Uh, so uh, as to answer your question, and uh, I don't know of work in that direction. Uh, I mean, yes, but not on not on e-voting. And um, I mean, we might actually look into this a little bit uh, for for our paper on uh, institutional reactivity from a legal standpoint, uh, which I think is is interesting. You know, like how how can we follow things when they change so fast? It's it's hard, especially in in uh, systems like both the U.S. and France. Taiwan is better, I think, for as long as it exists. Um, so anything else? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm free to discuss this, by the way. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a very interesting answer. Thank you. So it, so it sounds like you're personally in this project dealing with this. <laughs> yes, yes. I, 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 I mean, I'm exchanging with election officials right now. I am, I mean, you know, you, you, you wonder about sleep problems when you think, Hey, am I being sued? <laughs> like it's uh, like we 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 had a few sleepless nights about this, especially when when we so initially the CNRS didn't give its backing for this project because they thought we didn't have enough evidence, um, and and that meant that if we published anything, we were personally liable, uh, and they could have sued us for a few million euros. Um, so now, you know, I'm hoping that because I'm in a big institute and everything, they will think twice because, you know, it's, even if I'm right, you know, even if you are correct, you can be facing a 10 year lawsuit, especially in France. Uh, and it's costly it, mentally, if nothing else. Um, so, um, so yeah. Uh, there's a, a question about how responsible people are to voting electronically instead of voting normally. Oh, I like the opposition between electronically and normally. Um, no, I mean, really, I mean, especially it's in France, it's, it's exactly that. Uh, because if you ask people, do you vote electronically in France? People say, no, I think there's, I think it's about 30,000 people vote electronically in France as part of a experimental program that was started and then discontinued. Um, and um, so the effects on participation, uh, I don't know, they're, they're hard to track, especially in like right now with COVID and stuff. Uh, I think uh, Ted is the one who defends the idea that any change in a voting system can only be evaluated once it's been used for three main elections so that people get used to it. Um, and the problem is, you know, how do you differentiate the, the use of a system from the noise? Like, is it that people vote more now than they voted before or less now? Is it that we switch to electronic system? It's uh, comparative studies are hard to, uh, it's to create, especially ones that need to last 15 years. So it's more like natural experiments that you would need to look at. 
Um, and I don't know any natural experiments on e-voting versus paper voting. Um, um, yeah, there, there, there have been some studies in England on paper versus versus e-voting, and there are ways of speeding up the. If you you can pre-train people uh, and give them experience with with the voting system and get better results uh, in the first election, uh, it, it it's been done a couple of times and it's really worth doing. Uh, drive around in RVs, getting people to try it out, try it at malls, try it at grocery stores, everything like that. So that 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 has been done and and effective at helping, you know, get people to not make mistakes the first couple of times. Well, thank you, um, Anka, for an interesting talk. Um, with this, uh, we conclude our meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab, and we'll be back on Wednesday morning for. Uh, a master's thesis presentation on the SBP protocol. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to talk about all this. But by the way, just one thing. Uh, if you want the information on the article, like the articles and everything, you can ask me. They're not fully public yet. Uh, and uh, But the, the data, the recordings, the scripts, we downloaded everything. So we, we're not sharing it freely. But, you know, if you want to do an independent analysis, that is more than welcome. We will be posting uh, a link to a video of this talk on the CDL's uh, website at UMBC. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, everybody. Bye.